Hey, as you can see, I'm on my channel, War Backwards is Raw, and I'm going to attempt to put my work on The Curse of Canaan by Eustace Mullins. My notes and my talk and comments about this book. Now, I'm going to make this a comprehensive video and by that I mean I'm going to put on it as much as possible. So you can listen to it and then stop it, pause it, go off somewhere else, come back to it. But I want to try to put my work on Eustace Mullins on one video. And I believe I'll be able to get chapters 1, 2, and 3. So hang in there with me, and if you look at the time and you see this is a very lengthy video, it's because I'm combining all my videos on Eustace Mullins. So we're going to go to The Curse of Canaan by Eustace Mullins, and we're going to be in Chapter 1, Part 1. Okay, in this series of videos, I'm going to attempt to talk about a book that I picked up. I was fortunate to find this in a Goodwill store, and I think I paid only $2 for it. The Curse of Canaan, a Demonology History by Eustace Mullins. So what I'm going to try to do is talk a little bit about the contents of the book and go over it with you. I'm not going to read the book to you. So there will be some of my own interpretation in this. There will be some of my own bias and there will be some of my own errors perhaps. But this is an attempt to just try to bring to you the content of the book, The Curse of Canaan, a demonology, a demonology of History by Eustace Mullins. Okay, Eustace will talk about start talking about an Arcadian scene. And he will use the, the Sistine Chapel in the Vatican as an example of this. Now this is my comment. Those of you that know history has been hoaxed on us. The Sistine Chapel is probably just another Masonic hoax with the invention of a Masonic character by Michelangelo. But nevertheless, Eustace Mullins will use this concept of Arcadia. And Arcadia literally is a mountain region in southern Greece. Now, in poetic fantasy, it represents a pastoral paradise where there are song-loving shepherds. And in Greek mythology, it is the home of Pan. Now, none of that content is in the book. I'm just explaining it to you in case you're not familiar with the term Arcadia and Arcadian. Eustace Mullins starts out trying to tell us that we're unable to recognize evil.
Now, why are we unable to recognize evil? Because evil is in disguise. Now, this is not in Eustace Mullins' book. I'm only trying to illustrate the concept, so please don't look for it in his book. But for example, something called the Patriot Act. And as soon as you hear that term, your mind will say, that must be wonderful, because it has the word patriot in it. However, if you begin to unravel the Patriot Act, you will realize that it's just evil in disguise. Now many, many, many of these acts are given names that cause people to think they're wonderful. And the one that I've harped on a lot is called the Smith-Mont Modernization Act. And it sounds wonderful, because it's modernized. But what it is, is it is the taking of all media and putting it in the control of the government and granting to every source of media here in the United States to use propaganda against the American people. In other words, the permission to lie, and to lie, and to lie. Now this doesn't sink into the population, and I've tried and tried and tried to tell people propaganda is legal. Now these are just examples, they're not in Mullen's books, it's my example. So evil is in disguise, now he also says that we've learned to tolerate evil. In other words, people just don't get too upset about things anymore these days. My example, not used to Smolin's example, abortion. It is so downright evil to rip out human life from the womb of a woman. It is beyond my comprehension how, as a society, we have learned to tolerate it. Now that's my example, not used to smallness. So, we're going to go now to approximately page two in the book. And that was pretty much page one. So I'm going to go to page two. And I apologize for the noises. This is kind of a primitive setup. And I'm not the best, I don't do a lot of editing, but I'm trying to give good content for you, my viewers. So please tolerate me. And don't, by the way, don't tolerate evil, just tolerate me. All right, so now about page two, the Curse of Canaan, uh, Mullins is going to tell us like what has been the biggest uh, concept or philosophy or whatever that has put this all sort of under its umbrella and that is secular humanism now if you can take the word secular and just sort of say, basically, it's the removal of God and the removal of Bible. And you can go back in time to when the public schools removed the Bible. Yes, that was a big major event for us because it was basically saying that no longer is education based on Bible and no longer is society to be structured on Bible but it will be structured on humanism. Now, humanism is the idea of always putting human interest first and at the center of everything, okay? Now, Mullins will go into 
something that maybe a lot of you are familiar with, and that is the Nephilim. Now the Nephilim come into Bible history in Genesis chapter 6, verse 4, where the sons of God, which are demonic entities, have relations with the daughters of men. In other words, it's like a hybrid. It's like a cross-breeding between human beings and demonic entities entities. And out of that crossbreeding came strong men, mighty men. Now this isn't Mullen's comment, but it's mine. It all makes perfect sense to me because if you study the mythology of, of Greece and Rome, you will see the uh, products of these Nephilim which we call mythology. But most likely what we call mythology was reality. In other words, those, those things that are studied under Greek mythology or Roman mythology actually did exist. Now that makes a lot of sense to me. And I was very, very confused in life about these types of things until finally I got hold of the idea of the Nephilim or the mighty ones. Now Mullins will say that basically they're behind everything, the Nephilim. And what happens is this. Secret societies are interested in contacting demonic entities in any shape or form. And they have different branches of different expertise in contacting these demonic entities. Now that is true because secret is basically occult. And occult in the Latin is hidden. And that's why you must pledge silence because it is all about keeping your mouth shut as to why things work out so well for you in the secret society. Now this is my comment that basically secret societies are like prayer groups. Now I'm not trying to, to um, mock or anything prayer groups because absolutely every, every individual in church needs a prayer group. But the secret societies are like reverse prayer groups. They're not praying to the one true God. They are praying to Lucifer to send his angels to get what they want. And once again, it's an exchange. The uh, demons will give things out to people if they get certain things. And what are they going to get out of it is they disguise evil and they bring evil in the world. So yes, hidden societies, secret societies are spreading evil and they are right in your town or city in the United States. They are right in your town or city anywhere in the world. And the largest perpetrator of this, of course, is the group that we know as the Masons and all their offshoots. So the next area we're going to go into is the flood. And God decides that basically everyone needs to be wiped out. And the ark 
Eustace Mullins will tell us on page 8 is the greatest engineering feat of all times. So I think I'm going to stop here right now. I've got to do about page 6 and I'll try to keep these videos within a certain time frame. But once again, you've been watching and listening to some type of analysis of the Curse of Canaan, a demonology of history. Now I like the way he worded that, a demonology of history. Not a history of demonology. What he's trying to tell us is if you really want to know true history, it's all about the work of demons among us and how they've deceived. And the author is Eustace Mullins, and I'm just trying to provide a basic outline of what he has said in his book and then give you some of my thoughts and my commentary on it. So I'd like to thank you for... Okay, now we're going to go to Chapter 1, Part 2. Hey, you are watching The Curse of Canaan. A Demonology of History by Eustace Mullins and this video is chapter 1 part 2. Now let's just review quickly from the first video we talked about the usage of the word Arcadian which is kind of a pastoral setting that's it's really quaint and nice and Mullins suggests that most of us dwell in an Arcadian type setting and we're unable to recognize evil. Why? Because oftentimes it's in disguise and then we've been conditioned to tolerate evil. And what is the big umbrella that under which all this is? Secular humanism. What is the power or the source of the evil? Primarily it's the Nephilim and all the offshoots of the Nephilim or the Mighty Ones and how do they uh, operate in society today basically through the secret societies and namely the number one would be Freemasonry which is in every town every city in the United States and is scattered indeed throughout the world in towns and cities so now we're going to go to part two of chapter one. Now, he does talk about the flood and that after the flood there is a sin by Ham. But he actually will talk a little bit about uh, a sin on the ark by Ham, which I, as far as I know is not in biblical record. Now, as far as I know, it's not in biblical record, but he, he cites that there was additional sin by Ham on the ark. Now, what will happen is after the ark settles in, there will be a curse pronounced upon Ham's son, who is Canaan. Now Noah will curse Canaan because of the evil that was committed through Ham by his son Canaan. Now that's the title of this book, The Curse of Canaan, and Mullins pretty much summarizes it and says that's what's been happening for the last 3,000 years. So he's probably taking a very young view of the earth and of humankind. 
which I would agree with. One time I wasn't in that particular viewpoint, but I think I am right now. Now, Mullins will borrow from extra biblical sources and other documents of history, which is good because he's trying to fill in the gaps. Now, where it becomes a little questionable is, can we rely upon these extra biblical sources? And he will say that there was more to the sin of Canaan and Ham than just uncovering the nakedness of Noah. And he will cite that it is possible that Canaan indulged in unnatural relations with his grandfather. Now that's questionable, and Mullins is to be commended for filling in gaps. It's just as you read Mullins, you have to realize that where he fills in the gaps, you may want to have some question marks. Now I want to read to you a quote by Mullins, which I feel deserves to be read. I'm avoiding reading to you because, first of all, it will put you to sleep, <laughs> and secondly, nobody will want to watch if I just simply read the book to you. But here's what he says on page 8. The curse of Canaan was extended to the land which was named after him, land of Canaan. The Canaanites themselves, the people of the land, became the greatest curse upon humanity, and so they remain today. Not only did they originate the practices of demon worship, occult rites, child sacrifice, and cannibalism, but they also went abroad. They brought these obscene practices into every land which they entered. Not only did they bring their demonic cult to Egypt, but also known by their latter name, the Phoenicians, as they were called after 1200 B.C. They became demonizers of civilization through successive epochs, being known as medieval history as the Venetians, who destroyed the great Byzantine Christian civilization, and later as the black nobility, which infiltrated the nations of Europe and gradually assumed power through trickery, revolution, and financial uh, Legermain. Sorry, on my last word during the quote. <laughs> Anyhow, you got the idea that they definitely went out and spread their evil. Now we've got to go from Ham down the line to some other individuals, and one of which is of great notation here, from Ham to Cush, and from Cush to Nimrod. So we see the progression. Now Ham supposedly stole the garments that covered Adam and Eve. Now once again, Mullins is borrowing on extra biblical sources outside the Bible. Are they correct? I'm not going to say for sure they are, and I'm not going to deny that they're, that they're correct. Not correct. But I'm just going to say, I, I, we always need to put a question mark if it's not the Bible. So he says that in this literature, outside of Holy Scripture, that these garments had some type of additional magical power. Now that's questionable, all right? However, I do find that a lot of what 
Mullen says is very, very good. So he's definitely worth reading. It's just that we need to have some caution here. Now, Nimrod is supposedly born on the 25th of December. And I know there's a lot of folks out there that want to get rid of celebrating Christmas. And I do understand their perspective. However, I'm not in that particular camp or category, and I hope that doesn't offend you or get you upset with me. But he does say that December 25th supposedly is the date of birth of Nimrod. Now, we go from Nimrod to, guess what? The Tower of Babel. Okay, at the Tower of Babel, Nimrod is at his height. In other words, he has organized humanity to rebel against God. And I'm not too certain of all the meaning of the tower. It is assumed it was a ziggurat. And the higher up you go, the more you got in touch with the powers of evil. Mullins will point out that X is the symbol for Nimrod. Now, uh, I just did some videos on I Loathe Lucy. And in particular, when she has this dream that she's in Kildunan and investigating her Scottish ancestry. And they do sword dancing. Now, they take the sheath and the sword and form the letter X and put it on the ground and dance around it. Now, I just talked about it in numerology as the number six, which is true in simple numerology. But, according to Mullins, X is a symbol for Nimrod. And he also mentions when you've always, when you've seen those shortened versions of Xmas, not Christmas, he says that's basically a reference to Nimrod not Christ. Now Nimrod is the first man to rule the earth according to Mullins. Now I would place in that category he's the first representative of Antichrist. In other words Nimrod was not the Antichrist but he strongly showed the world who Antichrist is by his actions and what he did. So the Bible will tell us about there is the Antichrist we're waiting for. There have been Antichrist, plural, meaning men who embody everything that the Antichrist will embody, and then there's the spirit of Antichrist. And uh, it's the two latter that we're facing, the spirit of Antichrist and those who uh, perform as if they're the Antichrist. We're awaiting the Antichrist. Now, Mollins doesn't mention those three things. I do, and I'm giving you that as commentary. Now, another very interesting thing that Mollins will tell us is, and I'm going to have to change my paper here, Very interesting. 
Those of you that like etymology and words, you take the word Canaan, which is the name of the son of Ham, and then the name of the land, and the name of the individuals who are all offsprings of evil, and then you combine it with Baal, or Baal, which is the false god or ruler of this world, or the ancient pagan name for their god, and then you combine those two words and you get cannibalism. And yes, according to Mollins, all of these who are involved with the Canaanites practice cannibalism. Now, let me just interject a word here. Uh, there are different levels in secret societies, and those at the lower levels probably do not know these particular rituals. Only those in the higher levels will probably know and understand cannibalism and even human sacrifice at the highest levels. So those who've entered these secret societies at the lower levels, they just see like a club or a brotherhood where you can get away with certain things because you know so-and-so, or you get a discount, or you get extra business because they're a member of the club or secret society. They know nothing of these horrendous Canaanite rituals such as child sacrifice and cannibalism. Now, according to Mullins, who again is borrowing on sources outside the Bible, uh, Shem will behead Nimrod. And he's borrowing on uh, Josephus, the historian. And Josephus is pretty well recognized as a valid source of uh, Roman history and biblical history. So Shem will behead Nimrod. Now, after beheading Nimrod, he will take the pieces of the body of Nimrod and send those pieces out to these various locations where these cults operate. In other words, Shem was trying to send the message. If you continue to practice these practices, uh, you will end up like Nimrod, cut in pieces. Now what happened was that upon receiving these pieces of his body, the priest and the cult members treated them as treasures. Treasures. They got a piece of the body of Nimrod. And hence, uh, it kind of backfired. In other words, the cut-up body became almost like a parallel to communion or Lord's Supper. The body of Jesus broken. It's kind of like a parallel to that, but in an evil manner. Okay? So one of the a lot of these what are called mystery cults have come out of this. Hey, I'm uh, recording over my recordings <laughs> and listening to my own lecture series on The Curse of Canaan by Eustace Mullins. And at that point in the presentation, I talked about the cutting up of the body of Nimrod and the pieces being distributed as a warning. And yet what they did was they took the pieces and used them as sacred rites. Now I did a lot of work on flagpoles. And at first in my work I centered on the actual usage of flagpoles for radio antenna, either to receive or to send. 
radio waves. And indeed, those metal poles have that function. But I made a discovery, and the discovery was this. When people salute the flag, they are saluting the pole, not the flag. The flag's irrelevant. And the pole is a phallic symbol of the shaft of Nimrod. And that's why atop of every flagpole, there's a ball shape. And those ball shapes are coming down and they're putting up uh, some devices that are being used for electronic uh, means to replace the top. But the old flagpoles always had a ball at the top. And no one could ever give me any answer on that, why that's up there. There's some nonsense about that's the last place you hide your ammunition in case the enemy attacks, some stupid thing. But I'm going to tell you now, I figured it out. It's the shaft of Nimrod, the phallic symbol, and the ball at the top tells you he was Baal. Baal, Baal, the god of this world, who ruled this world and still does. But Nimrod was the closest thing we have to the physical Antichrist. So anyhow, I figured that out, and I thought I'd interject it here. And if you want, you can put in the search part of my channels, flagpoles. And you'll see I have a lot of videos on them and struggled with them, but that's my final conclusion. Yes, they are used for uh, electronic purposes, but they're also used in worship. It is the symbol of Nimrod and the shaft of Nimrod, the phallic symbol. It is worshipped. Back to the lecture. Cults find their origin in Nimrod. All of them. And one of the ones that appears in biblical times, pre-biblical times, one of the cults that bothered the early church were called Gnostics. Now, why are they called Gnostics? It comes from the Greek word for knowledge. So, a Gnostic is someone who has knowledge. They are the knowing ones. And that's what all secret societies are based on. That's what all occult activity is based on, secret knowledge. You have to be initiated. You have to make yourself willing to be part of the cult or the society. Now, Mullins will tell us that there has been a war against the descendants of Shem ever since this day. The descendants of Ham, or the descendants of Canaan, have been extremely angered at the descendants of Shem because, first of all, Shem is the godly line, and, second, and, and the ungodly line comes through the descendants of, of Ham and Canaan. And the descendants of Canaan have sought to eliminate the descendants of Shem. In other words, genocide, mass murder. You won't find this in the educational system, Mullins makes note. You won't find it at university level, and you will not find it at uh, uh, seminary level or theological schools. So there's always been a war against the godly line. Now, that's easy to see in Genesis. There's two lines, the godly and the ungodly. Very easy to see. It also is sort of brought out by St. Augustine in his work, 
uh, the city of God, where there's the city of God and the city of man. So it's kind of easy to see, but yet Mollins makes it really, really clear it's coming from the burning anger of the descendants of Canaan and all their evil ways. They're mad that there's good out there. They're mad that there's holiness out there. And they don't want any parts of it, and they just want their system to rule and reign on this earth. So Paul the Apostle talks about it in a different manner in Ephesians 6, about the spiritual battle in the armor of God. Now a lot of what you hear is not coming out of, um, it's not coming out of uh, the book, Eustace Mullins. I'm interjecting some of my own thoughts here, but I am trying my best to use Mullins as a framework. So we're going to go to the next thing, and I need to clear my board. Okay, we're going to talk about what's called the will of Canaan. Okay, now the will of Canaan has five basic points to it. And this is kind of the document for the Canaanites. We might say this is the document for all evildoers. So if you make the world into two groups of people, evildoers and good doers, or unbelievers who love and serve Satan versus believers who love and serve Christ. I know I'm oversimplifying it, and it's not exactly the way Mullins presented it. But I'm going to give you the content of what Mullins said. These are five charges, or five instructions, that need to go out to all the descendants of Canaan. And that is, love one another, and I'm going to put in there the club. Now, Mullins doesn't put it that way, but love only the members of the club or the secret society. Now, what else should you love? <coughs> Robbery. Theft. Stealing. And basically, the entire monetary system that we know, taxes and everything, is basically just theft. Sorry to sell, tell you, <laughs> I, know, I know you're a believer that your tax dollars help repair the roads and all that. And it, it is just a very, very slight amount of truth there. But for the most part, we're all being openly robbed. And how much are we being robbed? At least one third of your life's earnings. All right, what's the next thing you love is lewdness. Now, when I said you, I didn't mean you, you. I mean, if you're a member of this secret cabal, if you're a member who, who wants to be a Canaanite and participate in evil, you love anything that's perverted or anything that smacks of just open sin, uh, anything that that is basically against God and His Word. And then you are to hate something. Who are you to hate? Hate your masters. Hate the people who really want life to be fair and good for everyone. In other words, hate the teacher that insists on the rules <laughs> in the school. Hate the one who insists on you obeying things so that everything is fair for everyone. Hate your masters. Now, included in that would be the brothers. There was Shem, Ham, and Japheth. So hate Japheth and hate Shem. So if we're going to look at it, just hate your brothers, because the brothers would have been rules ruling over them, over Ham and his descendants. And then the last thing is. Do not 
speak truth. So, is there a hoax lie system? Absolutely. Is it massive? Absolutely. Now, I remember when I first got into understanding truth, and I first came across the whole idea of being lied to, I only saw it as occasional lies here and there. I knew there were some occasional lies, all right? But I had no idea that it was massive. I had no idea that it's basically everything, all right? And for me, that was the hardest pill to swallow. You know, like the two pills presented in the movie The Matrix. Which pill are you going to swallow? That everything is basically fine, and it's an Arcadian existence, right? Back to Mullins. His Arcadian existence, right? That everything is an Arcadian existence? With maybe an occasional blotch on the, on the green pasture, or maybe an occasional uh, animal that causes a little commotion? Or is it the land of Canaan with demonic entities controlling our lives? And human beings who have pledged themselves to these five charges of Canaan, the commissioning of the Canaanites, and basically what we call the controllers, which people call the Illuminati. Um, you can have a number of different terms for them, but basically they are in line with the will of Canaan. They are in line with this document. And that is who we face in the hoax lie system. So I think I'm going to stop right here because I think I have said enough. And once again, I... Okay, we're now going to proceed to Chapter 1, Part 3. Hey, you're watching The Curse of Canaan, A Demonology of History by... Eustace Mullins. Now I'm not going to read it to you. I'm going to present to you some highlights of the book and provide to you some commentary on the book. You are invited to read the book and you are invited to comment uh, upon my video. I do not hold a perfect uh, analysis of his book, but I am trying to bring his book out into the open so that we can take a look at what he has written. Now this is a review from the last video I made. It was called The Will of Canaan. These are the instructions that were left to the descendants of Ham through his son Canaan who became the Canaanites. First they were to love all those within the tribe and I put their club that's a little better understanding today than the use of tribe. And love robbery, lewdness, and hate your masters. Now by that would be meant uh, the two uh, brothers of Ham and their descendants. So you're to hate the ones who are supposed to rule over you. And then never speak the truth. Now we know that's true because you're watching this channel and you know that you're not going to get truth in your history books. You're not going to get truth in your newspaper or your news spellcasters. So we have to realize that basically we're always dealing with hoaxes and lies. Okay, the will of Canaan will become the, the blueprint or the uh, instruction guide or instruction manual for the descendants of Canaan. And the will of Canaan 
those five points I made will be enforced in the land of Canaan. And then those instructions will go out all over the world as commerce spreads, as population spread, and so forth. So what happened? Well, there was a big, we'll use the word, mistake made. And what was the mistake? Well, basically the mistake was to not kill off the heirs and descendants of Ham and Canaan. And the Israelites were given specific instructions over and over and over again to annihilate these descendants. Now I'm going to pause right here and interject some commentary. I know one of the hardest, most difficult things for some folks is when they read the Old Testament, they will clearly read in Scripture that God has instructed the Israelites to annihilate the people of the land. Now, many, many people cannot handle this. And they then turn to the idea that the God of the Old Testament was evil and cruel. And then the God of the New Testament is nice and good. And they make a false dichotomy, and then they turn the true faith into a mystery religion. But the truth of the matter is this. The evil that came through Canaan was so great and so horrendous and filled with such abominations that a holy God had only one instruction. Take them out. Now, because they did not follow this instruction, the will of Canaan is everywhere. Now, that would be what folks call the New World Order. It's along the same lines. They're just different terminologies that are used for the same thing. Practitioners of the New World Order practice essentially the same things that were listed in those five things of the will of Canaan. So as history progressed and as the population grew and as people expanded beyond the regions of Canaan, the evil spread. And how far did it spread? Throughout the whole world. Now we know this is possible because God destroyed the whole world with the flood of Noah times. In other words, God saw no hope for anyone except Noah and his descendants, a righteous line. So we do know that it is possible for evil to spread to the entire world. And that's what we're looking at today. Okay, now we're still in chapter 1, and I put the chapters up ahead there. Uh, the numbers in the right corner are just my numbers about my notes, so I don't get mixed up as I'm trying to bring them to you. Okay, so Mullins will point out on page 18, there is a 3,000 year historical blackout. Now what does he mean by that? Well, what he means is, no one is bringing out this intense battle with evil as clearly as he is pointing it out in his book. Now you might want to disagree, but I I'm going to hang in there with Mullins and say, you know what, I think he's right. Nobody wants to go this far with placing the blame where it needs to be placed in the Bible on the conquest of the land and the failure 
of the Israelites to do properly as God instructed. So I know everybody, not everybody, but there's a lot of folks out there that are pro-Israel. And that's a whole nother video. But if you even just stop and think about what Mullins is saying, even if you believe that that's a genuine Israel, which it's not, <laughs> Mullins is trying to tell you that the original Israelites failed God, big time. So here's some scriptures, I won't read them, you can look them up, you can freeze this if you want, and look them up, Joshua 17, 13, Numbers 33, 52 to 56, and the end result of not heeding God's commands. The Canaanites live freely among the children of Israel. The children of Israel then will what? Do evil in the sight of the Lord. Judges 4, 1, 2. Now Mullins points out that there was a time when their abominations were just practiced openly. And you can read that in Psalm 106, verse 37 to 38. He points out the prohibition against intermarrying, and that we see that in uh, Jacob, in Genesis 28, 1. Then he points out the prohibition against mingling, against getting to know these folks who practice these abominations. And why is that so? Because when an individual begins to see how witchcraft can bring results in people's lives, they want a part of it. And by the way, Witchcraft is presented in the name of Christianity. And that's another video. That's another subject. But that's why you don't mingle. Now, please hear me out. I'm not saying that you can't witness. I'm not saying that you can't show love. But you don't mingle. You don't get involved in their practices. You don't accept their ways as good ways because they're evil so what will happen is this those people that practice these things become a terror and this is my notation there Jeremiah 24 9 they are the true terrorists no nobody's waiting to strap a bomb around their waist and come into your church or your school and blow themselves up to kill others. No. That's not the terror that we're talking about. We're talking about the terror of lies coming at you full force and you wanting to believe them. Now, I say that because I know that. I believed almost all the lies at one time. Now, <laughs> I believe none of them. But you see, they are the terrorists. And their terrorism is not bullets and bombs. It's lies, hoaxes. And it's getting you to do things that will harm yourself or harm others. All right, so let's go on to the next page. Again, we're still in chapter one of Mullen's book. And at this rate, <laughs> I'll probably have about 40 videos. <laughs> but that's okay, it's good stuff, and it's provocative. So I hope that this uh, brings about some serious thought in your life. Now, again, he points out in the Bible there are to be no covenants with the Canaanites. Now, Mollins doesn't say this, but I'm going to say this. This is the basis of the hoax system of your 
phony driver's license with your name in capital letters. Your name in capital letters on everything that you think you own. But in all honesty, it becomes a covenant with the system of evil. Now, there are those out there that try to tell you don't contract. And I know what they're saying. And probably, technically, they're correct. But what I'm going to tell you is this. You're not going to win. Because the devil does rule this world. And if you get stopped for speeding, and you think that after the officer handed you a ticket, you're not going to contract. <laughs> you are going to get yourself fine after fine after fine smacked on you or your corpse with the oration. And you will probably regret ever trying that nonsense. All right? So why do I take that position instead of the others? Because I'm trying to save you from a lot of nonsense and heartache and heartbreak. And here's why. Jesus said, render to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. In other words, yeah, it's a scam. Caesar was a scam. Yes, yeah, Caesar scammed the people with his taxes. But, but you're helpless in, the, in, in this world because the devil rules this world. But then he says, render unto God what belongs to God. And you know what belongs to God? Your body, your soul, and your spirit. So, yeah, pay the man. That's right. It hurts. But never give to the man or the system your body, soul, and spirit. Because they belong to God. So, Mullins points out that the United Nations is part of this covenant with Canaanites, and I put United Nations scam. Uh, Mullins doesn't use the word scam. I did. Then he talks about, again, how they were to destroy the groves and the shrines and everything associated with these abominations. And guess what? They didn't. So Israel failed. Now that's why we have the world we have right now. And let me say something about this destroying the groves and the shrines. Whenever you're in a town or city in the United States, somewhere perhaps in the heart of the town or the city, you're going to find some groves and shrines. Oh, I know. We call them a memorial too, and then they'll list all the different wars and things like that. What do you think they are? They're groves and shrines to a hoax system. Yes, war is a hoax. And I've got a whole bunch of information on that. War Backwards is Raw channel. But there have been times when I'm in a small town or city, I will stop at one of these things that were built by the Masons, and I will look at it, and I will see evil. In fact, I will actually sometimes pray over them, rebuking the powers of evil that exist in these groves and shrines. Now you can do what you want, but be aware, everywhere in the United States are groves and shrines that have been put there by the Masons, and they do emanate evil and demonic forces. So that once you come near them, you will believe the lies. All right, so that's my commentary. And he reminds us that the modern age that we now live in is a result of the failure 
of God's people to do what they were supposed to do. And in all honesty, throughout the whole Old Testament, it is this same struggle. And in all honesty, by the end of the Old Testament, it was never achieved. God's people again and again and again fell into sin, open rebellion, worship of false God, abominations. Now, the old covenant failed. So therefore, all the answers come in the new covenant. Now, Mullins isn't going, going quite in the direction I just took you, and I kind of use Mullins as a takeoff for some of my commentary, but I do want to try to stick to the basis of Mullins' book, and I'm still working through chapter one. Thank you for watching this, and I encourage you to okay. read the book, and if you are reading it, please leave some commentary too. Thank you. Okay, so now we are ready to go to chapter one, part number four. The Curse of Canaan by Eustace Mullins, chapter one, part four. You are joining a presentation of the content of The Curse of Canaan, A Demonology of History by Eustace Mullins. And I hope to complete chapter one in this video. Okay, so we're in chapter one of this book, and Mullins tells us that the Canaanites will begin to spread across the earth. He also brings up the fact that in the Bible, in the New Testament, in the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus encounters a woman who's a Canaanite woman. And he refers to her as a dog. And remember, her response back was, but even the dogs eat the scraps from the master's table. And so Jesus then works the healing in the life of that woman that was called a dog. I think Mullins brings out a pretty good point here in that even the Lord Jesus Christ used this terminology to talk about the Canaanites. So, was Jesus aware of these evil practices? Obviously, yes. And was Jesus compassionate even upon a descendant of Canaan? Absolutely, yes. Keep in mind that I try to give you uh, content from Eustace Mullins, but I also add a little bit of my own commentary. Now, Mullins will tell us uh, that the chief god of the land of the Canaanites is Baal, B-A-A-L. Now, my footnote on that is anytime you see something in hoax history related to a Baal, B-A-L-L, -L, it's a reference to Baal. For example, Lucille Baal. Lucy, code word for Lucifer, and Baal, code word for Baal. Uh, I did some videos on her uh, and some of the uh, strange things that occur in the Lucy, I Love Lucy series, especially the one where they're in uh, Kildunan. Lucy has a dream. And she goes to this town in Scotland in her dream and the truth of the matter is in that town they practice human sacrifice so although a lot of the Lucy, Lucy I Love Lucy shows are funny underneath and underlying is the Canaanite religion of human sacrifice so you can check that out um, and one of my channels, I think it's Real versus 
R E A L or R E E L. But anyhow, I have lots of channels and I get mixed up where my videos are. So the uh, image that is presented of Baal, uh, the physical image, he says, is of three heads of a cat, a man, and a toad. Now, I never knew that. Of course, the worship of Baal involves ceremonies. And one of the biggest ceremonies that they have, of course, is human sacrifice. Now, has human sacrifice continued to be practiced? It is practiced in the world. Was it practiced here in the United States? If you read the right people and know the right sources to refer to, you'll find out that folks like Benjamin Franklin, yes, practice human sacrifice. Human sacrifice, cannibalism, cannibalism, remember those are two words put together, Canaanite, Canaan's, and Baal, putting together Canaan and Baal, cannibalism, children given over in sacrifice, and a lot of this is done where? In shrines and groves, hidden. Let me just make a comment here. This is not Mullen's comment, it's mine. Um, most Masonic temples, uh, they will make sure that the windows are covered up and in some places they'll actually brick over the windows where I was living in Virginia one of the local towns uh, they had a place above a restaurant and rather than cover the windows they removed them and put brick there and you could see where they removed the windows so no one could look in so the groves and the shrines the hidden are right in your own town. Drive by your Masonic temple or lodge area and you'll see. If it does have windows, they cover them up. And if there is an open window, it's just their lobby. But they do not want people to see what they do behind closed doors. And so the windows uh, oftentimes are sealed and you can't look in. Okay, now, Mullins will bring out that a lot of this will spread to, uh, to the true faith through King Solomon. And incidentally, back to the Masons, that's why the Masons love Solomon so much. Because although Solomon was, was given the title like the wisest man on earth because of his wisdom, he later became abominable, an abomination in the eyes of God because he compromised the true faith and he reinstituted these dreadful practices of the Canaanites. In fact, I heard one uh, Bible scholar or commentator even question whether King Solomon would be in heaven because of, of the terrible desecration that he brought to the nation by reinstituting the practices of the Canaanites. Now, two of the most terrible practices that Mullins will point out are the fire of Moloch, where children are literally thrown into the fire as a sacrifice, and then what's called foundation sacrifice. And that is that when a house is built, they will sacrifice a child and they will leave the body uh, embedded in the structure somewhere, somehow, some way. So um, I've heard of other strange things occurring like, I believe it would be the Hindus when they get to a new house, they bury the head of a serpent or something. I don't know. But anyhow, it's the same idea. 
uh, that they, they do this to bring good luck or their blessings of their God or whatever. But again, it's an abomination in the eyes of God. Now that would be on about page 24, just to give you an idea of where I'm at. Okay, so what's going to happen next is that the evil of the Canaanites is not openly discussed. Now, what does he mean by that? Or that's my terminology there. Um, it's purged from history books. It's purged so that it doesn't enter into seminaries. Okay, it's purged. You don't see hardly any trace of it in the educational system, K through 12, or even university level or graduate level. It is very, very hidden and buried. Now, what makes matters worse is that about 1200 BC, before Christ, using the old system of computation of time, the Canaanites disappear. Why? Now, Mullins brings this out over and over again because they just simply changed their name. They will become Phoenicians. And that word Phoenician is derived from the Greek word for purple because they get a monopoly on the color purple. This may bring about a new insight in our search for truth about the usage of purple in the hoax lie system. Okay, so the Canaanites now are the Phoenicians in history about 1200 BC. Now they were preparing for this in history by uh, fleeing to the city of Carthage. And he cites this about 900 BC. And the Carthaginians will go to war with the Greeks and they will survive. However, they will not survive the Roman uh, pillage of Carthage and the destruction of everything there. In fact, uh, I think he says in the city of Carthage, the Romans sowed salt so that it would just sort of like be like an acid or something, eat away <laughs> at everything, and nobody will, will, will even know that there was anything there. And he did say that basically uh, those who are interested in Carthage and the history and all that, they can't find any remnants of it anywhere. Now, Mullins will never ever let us forget that history, the true history, okay, not the hoax history, but the true history that we're all faced with is two diametrically opposed tides of history. And that is the Shemites, which become the Semites. Just drop the H. And the Canaanites, who are the true anti Semites. Now this really throws a curveball at me, okay? Because it's oftentimes associated with the Jewish folks that people are accused of being anti-Semite. But it's the opposite because Semite is basically Shemite. So the true anti-Semites are the Canaanites and all the descendants of uh, Ham through Canaan and all the evil ways that they have done. So this terminology that's used very, very frequently of accusation 
about being an anti-Semite has been reversed. The true anti-Semites, according to Mullins, are the Canaanites. Now the Canaanites will prosper through commerce and trade. And once again, Eustace Mullins reminds us that they are true to the will of Canaan. And it's those five points that I brought out to you in previous videos, whereby they are committed to lewdness, robbery, trickery, and never speaking the truth. That's why it's so hard, by the way, to get any accurate information about anything because they are absolutely sworn to secrecy. As a footnote, you will see sometimes in hospitals that stupid poster of a child with, with his finger up against his lips like going, shh. And they try to make it out like, don't talk in the hospital because People are sick, but really and truly, it seems to be a reference to the last point of the will of Canaan. Nobody's to say anything about anything, even if people are getting robbed uh, openly. All right, that was my little comment. It wasn't Mullins. All right, now Mullins will talk about the Christian knights going off to the Crusades. And Mullins' analysis of this is pretty interesting because he says basically they go off to the Crusades and the Canaanites are staying at home <laughs> and they can't wait to rob and steal while the knights are gone. So this is not Mullen's phrase, it's mine. Uh, while the cat is away, the mice will play. So the cat was gone, the, the, the knights were gone, the protectors of society are gone, and now, of course, the Canaanites have a feast day, and they will ravish the land. They will commit fraud. They will steal property. According to Mullins, the Knights will come home brokenhearted and broke and pretty much eliminated. And he, he basically says if any of them were left, they were just beggars on the street. Interesting. Very interesting. Uh, the type of history you're not going to get in your history class in high school or college. So Mullins will never let go of this because it is the truth. The Shemites or Semites, the godly line, versus the anti-Shemites or Semites. And that's the struggle of history. And keep in mind the accusation of being an anti-Semite has been reversed. That was page 32 of the book. Now how can we know the difference? How can you know if you're in the presence of a Canaanite? How can you know the difference by what you hear and see around you? Well, Mullins basically gives a biblical answer. It's just by their deeds you will know them. Okay? What exactly is the deed that's being pulled off in front of you? And I don't care who's doing it. I don't care how respected they are in the community. I don't care what position they hold. Is the deed evil? And if it's evil, it's a Canaanite, which means that things have been infiltrated. Politics completely infiltrated. Educational system, yes, infiltrated. Medical system, yes. Sorry to say. Sorry to say.
And Mullins will kind of express this concept that I think will echo in all of us as I read it. People of Shem have no idea what's going on. The people of Shem have no idea of what's going on. And then he issues another warning. Remember, the goal of the Canaanites is extermination. Genocide is real. And I have seen plenty of evidence of it within the last uh, year and a half here. Okay, pretty much I've tried to stay with uh, Mullins and give you what Mullins has said. Now I just want to give you just a couple little blurbs of my objections to some, some things that Mullins has written. Now my first objection is when he talks about the pyramids. Now Mullins it comes up with, you know, who built these pyramids and all that in ancient times. And I'm going to just flat right out and say that's hogwash. Now, you don't have to accept this. In fact, any of my videos, anything I say, no one has to accept anything. I'm only trying to do my best to give accurate information. Based on my research, I am certain that Napoleon built the ancient pyramids in and around the early 1800s. And furthermore, they were basically built by the British because Sir Robert Peel plays Napoleon. Yes, Napoleon's a fake. That's right. Wasn't going across Europe ravishing towns and cities and killing people. They were pulling hoaxes. War is a hoax. And yes, the Napoleonic Wars were hoaxes too. But I have a video, and I forget where I put it, on what channel, but in my video I will show you that Sir Robert Peel of England played Napoleon, all right? And Sir Robert Peel is, is credited with giving us Citywide police forces. Thank you, Mr. Robert Peel. <laughs> he founded the first city police force, and that is why they're called Bobbies in England, because it's after his name, Robert. Robert Peel puts on a costume and plays Napoleon. So while Napoleon's army is in Egypt, they're building these things. Armies oftentimes were builders. Now, just a little sideline on that too. Uh, when I lived in the Blue Ridge Mountains, there was a church that dated back to the Civil War. And the church was built during the Civil War with the help of Confederate soldiers. So what are they doing building a church? If they're, if they're out fighting Northerners, no way. They just built a church. They helped to build it. So this is not impossible. In fact, what I'm telling you makes a lot more sense than a mad man going from town to town, ravishing the whole area and killing people and everything. Uh, basically speaking, 
history's not composed of war after war after war. Now, where did the pho phony war start? I'm not entirely sure, but I'm going to tell you this. I believe that the ancient pyramids were built by Napoleon's army in the early 1800s when he was down that way in Egypt land. All right, so that, I object to that about the ancient pyramid stuff. No big deal. Anybody can be misled on that. And the other slight objection I have is it appears that, especially on page 32, uh, Eustace Mullins seems to get real close to making everything an issue of the skin. Now, <laughs> Mullins can be right on on a lot of things and then making be off on a few things, but his book is worthy of reading and um, much, much good information for anyone. Now this concludes chapter number one and if you have enjoyed this excursion please leave me a little note and let me know. I do appreciate your notes uh, left in the comment section so I know you're watching and especially if you got to the end of the video let me know because I know there's so many folks out there that only want to watch maybe five minutes or seven minutes and they want to move on to another video. So thank you much and I'll try my best to get through this book and I appreciate you being right there with me as I'm talking. Okay, so that concludes chapter number one, The Curse of Canaan by Eustace Mullins in my comments. And those Four videos can be found separately on my channel War Backwards is Raw. Just go to the section where you type in the search engine from my channel and type in Eustace Mullins and they should come up. Now I'm going to stop here with chapter one because there's a lot, of here, a lot on here and I'm going to make another video that will try to include chapter 2 and chapter 3. So I do want to thank you for watching this and I do want to ask you once again to echo what I said previously. Please leave me a comment even if it's just a real short comment. And the reason I'm asking for that is because if I know I'm in touch with you in some way, it inspires me. It empowers me to keep going on and creating videos. So please leave me a comment and let me know you're out there. And again, I'd like to thank you for watching this series. This concludes Chapter 1. End of videos.